Welcome back to session two. Now, uh, we're going to, it's a totally different change of pace or subject matter. The implications of these discoveries um, has led to me thinking, what's, what's the real meaning? What's the purpose? What's, what's going on here? So session two is doing a deep dive. We're going to do a deep dive into all sorts of ideas and we're going to cover um, different religious thought and personal growth. We're going to talk about mindfulness, which is um, very important. So let's begin. Um, the, the key, the key here is union, union of wills. This is, I believe, the purpose in life. Now, I haven't been to the Library of Congress, but if I was to go in and go to the religious section, I would be confronted with 360,000 religious texts. Now, if I was to really read one text a day for a thousand years, I would be the world's greatest theologian because I study other people's religious experiences. The problem is I haven't had my own religious experience. So here's the key. Life is all about having your own personal religious experience and being totally immersed in life. Now, I'm going to recount a little story. I made it up. And I made it up on, because of my experiences with the invitations that I received that I told you about in the beginning of the first session. So there's a young boy. He had six older brothers and sisters. And one day he decided, hmm, I'd like to do something for my father. So he decided to clean up the tool shed. And after a few hours on a weekend, he looked at the tool shed and he was very happy. It, it looked great. But he wasn't satisfied. So he thought, hmm. A couple of weekends later, he cleaned up the backyard, mowed the lawn, and it looked great. A few weeks passed. Ah, he's still not satisfied. So uh, his brothers and sisters are all playing with their various games and entertaining themselves. And they were very dismissive of his actions. They just said, why are you doing this, you know? He says, it's all right. Well, I'm happy. And then he thought, I think I'll go and talk to my father directly who was working, up in a, working in a study upstairs. And the, others, the other children said, you can't disturb Dad. He said, no, 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 it's all right. I'm, I think it'll be okay. So he walks up the stairs and then he walks along the hallway and he comes to the door of the study and he knocks on the door and instantly the door opens and he got a shock. And his father smiled and he said, I heard you walking up the hallway. He said, come in, son. He said, take a seat. Take a seat on the couch. What's on your mind? He said, oh, look, I'd like to do something for you. Something really, uh, you know, something that you would like. He said, I've, I've had a guess, you know. He said, oh, yeah. and the father said, oh, I know, I've been, I'm aware. Now, like any parent, if a child comes up and said, I'd like to do something for your dad or mum, the parent would be obviously very chuffed, very happy. But the parent knows what the young child would like or likes. So the father thinks, hmm, he says, can we go for a bike ride? The young boy says, oh, a bike riding. He goes, that's a good idea. And then the young boy thought, no, oh, I don't think my dad's into bike riding, though. And he goes, the father says, um, hmm, that doesn't appeal. What about we go down the beach? And again, the, the young boy said, oh, well, um, I don't think Dad would like the beach either. So he says, no, I'll pass on that, Dad. And then he goes, uh, movies. 
So we're up to invitation number three. So the movies. And the young boy thought, no, nah, what I'm into, my dad's not into. So invitation number four, the father turns around to his young son and he says, how about we go for a hike up into the hills? And the young boy said, that's it. That's it. We'll do that. So off they go. And the father said, look, I'll pack. I'll pack a tent and we'll camp overnight and we'll set up a campfire and we'll have a good catch up. And the young boy said, fantastic. So off they go and they have a terrific weekend. Anyway, on Sunday morning, they start to pack up and they start to walk home through the forest. And they come home and as they approach the house, all the other siblings are looking out the window and hanging at the door wondering, what happened? You know, what's going on? What's going on? And the young boy had a smile from ear to ear. He was so happy. And so the boy goes into the house and all the other siblings saying, you know, how was it? And he said, fantastic. And so eventually all the other children started running upstairs and saying, oh, Dad, you know, we really want to hang out. And so over the next six or eight months, they all got to have their different experiences because every child's got different likes. As time passed, this household became renowned for good company, generosity of spirit, and loss of humour. Now, I'm going to give you an interpretation about God's will. The first one, it, it develops. Religion is evolutionary. It evolved from, you know, worshipping rocks and then we started to get into nature spirits and then we started to worship gods in the heaven and slowly our ideas of religion grew and grew and grew. Instead of a vengeful God, we, we moved into a loving father, you know. It, it's constantly evolving. So, some people say, oh, it's God's will. It's a disconnection. There's no personal relationship, and this is the key. We're starting to move into personal relationship territory. It's not my will that your will be done. This is a form of negation. You would have heard it, but it is a type of negation. Then we move into the third one. It's my will, your will be done. Then, this is a positive affirmation. Okay, so it's developing. Then we come to the fourth one. The father inviting his son for a walk up into the mountains. It's a union of wills. I call this the supreme partnership and this is where magic starts to happen. Okay, I'm just going to di diverge a little bit because this is important. Before Joshua ben Joseph, and I like using the name Joshua ben Joseph instead of Jesus because there seems to be a bit of baggage around the name Jesus. This was his birth name, his family name. Now I keep saying as a man. I'll come back to that. Now women had little or no spiritual standing in older religions. We know that. What you don't know is that Joshua ben Joseph appointed women evangelists as a team, 50 of them and 12 apostles. He was one of the greatest liberators of women's uh, rights, particularly in that generation when men wouldn't even speak to women. 
he was a great liberator. And this is really important. Now you say, how do I know this? Because it's very detailed in this particular book about what Joshua, what Joshua did. Um, and I want to restate this because women can have a deep and personal relationship with the divine as per, as per the male. I mean, God created man and woman. As a father, the father wants a relationship with the daughters as much with the men, the sons. So wherever you see religious prejudice, be cautious. Okay. And I want to talk about Mary Magdalene. She had a bit of a bum, bum rap. She was one of the most effective teachers of the gospel among a group of 12 women that were set aside from the 50. How about that? No longer can man presume to monopolise ministry of religious service. Now, whether you find yourself ministering outside of a religious group or inside a religious group, you, you should, you, it's carte blanche. There's no restriction. I wanted to mention that to bring some balance because I think in the past it's been very unbalanced. Now, we're going to do some deep diving. The most honourable, venerable teacher of one of the greatest teachers of all time, Buddha. What has this to do with the discoveries in Jerusalem? Quite a lot, in fact, through personal experience. For those that don't know, and for those that are watching this video, Vipassana, Vipassana meditation is a demanding meditation technique. It can go for 10 days, it can go for 30 days. Uh, you meditate every day in different blocks for a few hours. And while you're in this retreat, you do not make eye contact with anyone. You do not speak to anyone. You do not have a mobile phone. You do not have a pen and paper. You go in with nothing. In fact, on the gate where I went, there was a sign saying, leave all religious traditions and rituals here at the gate. Now this posed a bit of a dilemma because I can't take the divine out of my heart and leave it at the gate. So I turned a dilemma into an opportunity. And I said a bit of a flip prayer. In other words, it was an invitation. There was, I wasn't asking for anything. I wasn't, there's nothing personal. I just said, come, let's do this together. A union. Let's do this meditation retreat together. So, in a way, I spiritized it. Now, the teachers suggest you don't share your personal experiences because you set up what's called, um, I think called sankaras or a bit of karma. In other words, when you're in that meditation retreat, what happens in the meditation retreat stays in the meditation retreat. You don't share it. But I've done a cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> and I think the benefit outweighs the cost. And what I'm sharing is actually written in a lot of religious texts in the East. And this is what happens. This is what happened. And this is the insight that I gained. Around day five, very, very deep in meditation and having worked through a lot of 
issues and trying to remain equanimous, I reached some territory where everything, everything turned into light particles, dancing light particles. My mind's eye saw everything. This is a type of, well, these light particles are referred to in the Eastern texts as kalapas, spelt with a K if you want to look it up, kalapas. And there, if you want to put it in terms of quantum physics, they're like energy particles coming in, coming out of existence, very quick. So you're in this ocean of light particles that are, that are just dancing. And it is suggested that at this moment, Buddha said, all things change. That's true. All things change. But as I was reflecting on the situation I found myself in, I thought, hmm, it's interesting. Do I change? And then one of the greatest universe paradoxes became very clear. And I may be able to give you an explanation. Because me is the paradox. You are the paradox. And the paradox is this. Personality is changeless but undergoes constant change. It is the only thing in the universe that holds this quality. And I thought, how can that be? How can we stay the same? Stephen, I'll always be acknowledged or known as Stephen, but undergo constant growth. Okay. Then it became apparent. Personality is not, is not a part of the time-space universe. Personality is a gift of God. God exists outside of the time-space universe. You are a son and daughter of God. Your personality is a gift. If you want another definition of God, I can give you one of the best you'll ever hear. And it's from that book, so I don't claim to have worked that one out. But God is personality. God can be nothing less than personality because we exist. We are personalities. God can be nothing less. So, this conclusion is also in this book. It said, you are children of God. So, now what? In this state of what they often call samadhi, I thought, okay, that's a nice conclusion. Let's get on with the meditation. It confirmed what I'd read. I'd experienced, I, I could see what, this, what the paradox was and I came to believe in the in the uh, explanation. So I said, okay, what now? So the meditation finishes. Uh, four or five days later. And there's a, uh, what we call dining hall. And in the dining hall there, at the one end of the dining hall, there's a servery bench. And I walked over to the servery bench and I ordered a uh, peppermint tea, I think it was, and I had my back to the room. And as I'm waiting for my peppermint tea to brew and get some honey or whatever, I hear these words. And this person says, I would like what you have. I couldn't see it, you know, obviously I was looking, and I thought, oh, I wonder who they're talking to. And I heard someone else say, yes, we would like what you have. And I go, I'm wondering, that's strange. 
And at the third time, when I heard it for the third time, I turned around and the entire meditation group was standing in a semicircle around me, looking at me. And they were all asking the same question. And I'm going, now you, I don't know what's going on here and you might have an explanation and you can work, work it out for yourself. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't know what I can give you, even if I knew what it was. And they were insistent. And I took my cup of tea, I walked out of the dining room, along the, the walkway and into my bunk room. Everyone followed. 30 people followed all the way. They were hanging out of the windows, looking through the windows. They were piled up into the doors. They were standing in the hallways and they kept saying, we want what you have, we want what you have. I sat still for that entire period. I did not talk to anyone. I did not say anything. I just sat. That's all you do. What is going on? And then weeks later, I realised what was happening. When you ask, it happens. Some chemistry, some, some, I can't describe it, something happens. Now, let's, we'll go over this because this is the crux. This is where it gets really important. God is personality. Personality is the great universe paradox. It is permanence with constant change. This paradox exists because of our personalities, has origin beyond the time-space universe. God is the origin and destiny, destiny. God is also the destiny of personality. Life is eternal and God lives within us. That's what crystallised for me. Now... Let's, let's do an exercise. Any mindfulness practice, any mindfulness practice, if you invite the divine in to work with you, it will happen. That you can be assured of. What would it be like if 30 people did that as well as of two facilitators? What would happen if people who are watching one person do it in a meditation group, imagine what it would be like when 30 people do it and both the facilitators, both the facilitators are on the same page. I think it would supercharge Buddhism. The mighty ship of Buddhism... Let me give you an analogy. At the end of this pier, there is a huge ship. Fantastic. It's full of countless people and a brilliant crew. Let's call them teachers. But the ship is still tied up at the wharf. All it is waiting on is its captain. And the captain is the divine leading within. Once the captain boards the ship, that ship will set sail across the seven seas. So, I suggest when practicing mindfulness exercises of any type, invite your divine parent to join you. Explore. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a few suggestions. When you acknowledge that you would like to have this dynamic going on, you want to go exploring. That's what I've been doing. I explore. I explore this territory. And I'm sharing with you my experiences. 
How does one have a relationship with God without any religious institution involved? Right? How can you do it personally? Ask. I mean, you are all beautiful people. You're all very gregarious. You're all very friendly. Okay? But God is not going to send you a text and say, let's have coffee tomorrow. All right? But if you ask, wow, different, very different. <clears throat> Joshua Ben Joseph was, is a son of God. But he divested himself of every spiritual resource that he was that he could have called or is embodied with he divested himself of everything all he wanted to do not all what he wanted to do was to demonstrate what a human can do with human potentials right when working with his divine father Many of the miracles in the earlier part of his life happened because he was aligning himself with his father's will and the miracles were happening around him. He didn't expect it. He was as shocked as much as anyone else. So, ask. And when you ask, you get choices. Do you want to go bike riding? Do you want to go to the movies? Do you want to go up in the hills and go camping? Or do I want to go to Mexico and enjoy a shamanic retreat and explore altered states of consciousness for 10 days? I chose to go into a war zone. It's about choosing. The better your selection of choice in the decisions that roll across the horizon towards you, the better the outcome. So ask, choose. Next, I have spoken to you about the God of personality. If you want another, I, I particularly like this one. See God as a friend. Fantastic. It's a, it, it's, in, in that book, the Urantia book, in the very last or second last chapter, it, right at the, at the end of the chapter, it says, Jesus, Joshua, saw God as a friend. As a friend. The paradigm I'm suggesting to you is um, dynamic. It's full of relationship. It's not chained down by ritual or tradition or ecclesiastical authority. It is one-on-one -on -one and it was demonstrated 2,000 years ago. So, here's another idea. As it says halfway down that slide, Sincerity is spiritual food, sorry, spiritual fuel. The more sincerity you can muster, the further you will travel. I can, I can say that 100% confidence. The more sincerity you can generate in this situation, the further you will travel, the greater your personal growth. In fact, I believe this is the most powerful personal growth strategy you could possibly embrace. Choose a meaningful place, no phone, no phone, stop the phones. It's a distraction. Now, if you have a friend coming from overseas and you haven't seen them for five or ten years, where would you take them? Would it be to a mountaintop or a particular place on the beach or, and you wanted to hang out with them? May I suggest, go there on your own without the mobile phone 
It's a place where you would take your best friend and ask for a relationship. Ask to get, hey, I'd like to get to know you. This is who I am. What can we do? The sincerity is the fuel. Okay, at this moment, the individual now has spiritual sovereignty. You have total sovereignty over your life. Really empowering. During this period, you might like to make your own ritual and tradition. Why not? Those 360,000 texts in the Library of Congress all have got their own personal interpretations and traditions and rituals and all of that. That's their journeys. Have your own. Structure it. Watch, watch, watch the magic unfold. Okay. We're still deep diving. Once you are in this space, in this new We'll call it realm. I like the, this realm of activity. The journey is both inward and outward. If you share your internal life with the divine within, you, you, you've got it. You've got it absolutely down pat. That's the inward journey. The outward journey is a life of love and service. Now, this is where we start to get into the the practical things and why many of the things that are happening in this world today aren't functioning the way they should, as we well know. So the outward expression is love and service. The inward expression is sharing your inner journey. That is your career. It is both in and out at the same time. Okay. Levels of spiritual growth. Now that you're getting into it, who's walked down these paths before in history? Well, I've put them into three categories. Practitioners of service and doing good. Wow, you know the service organisations around this world? Rotary, Lions, um, who knows, countless service organisations. I suggest to you that they are very close to God without realising it, without realising it. They're unconditional. They don't have to go to church. In fact, I suggest that a lot of the people who are, attend churches are more, um, what's the word, disconnected, I guess, than those that are in service organisations and doing good. Then we move on to the masters of doing good and proclaiming truth. So they do two things. They do good, then they pro proclaim truth. Teachers. And then you get the grand masters, of which there have only been a handful, doing good, proclaiming truth, and then achieving oneness with God. It is, you can do it. You can do it. It's your destiny. It is the destiny of every human being. You are not born out of a whim. You have purpose, divine purpose. Every human being has a purpose on this planet and in this universe. Okay, practitioners, as I said, service organisations, service-minded individuals, masters, masters of this. Gautama, Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tzu, um, Sir Roaster or uh, Moses, Guru Nanak, very interesting fellow, founder of Sikhism, and Paul of Tarsus in the New Testament. Paul wasn't an apostle. He was the guy who walked along the road to Damascus and had the epiphany. And then you had the grandmasters, Enoch and Elijah, Old Testament. Now, there's something really interesting about this. You think as generations move forward that they become more intelligent and more dynamic and have a greater impact in the world and our society is more advanced than the societies 2,000 years ago. Possibly in part, but from a spiritual point of view, not necessarily so, because Enoch was the first person, 
first human being to achieve oneness with God. And when that happens, there's a specific dynamic. And it's rarer today than it was many years ago. So, then we have in a league of his own, Joshua ben Joseph, a.k.a. Jesus, achieved oneness with God by the age of 31 years and six months. I said in the beginning of this talk in session one that life, the meaning of life, has two purposes. One, you experience life. Two, discover your destiny. He mastered that. Joshua, the man, not the son of God, I'm impressing upon you, Joshua, the man, only using human capacities and abilities, achieved oneness with God by the time he was 31. That sets a challenge for every one of you. That's why if, if people in their 20s and late teenage years really go for it, you know, they can cover a lot of territory in 20 or 30 years. For us older guys, <laughs> you know, we're starting a little bit late. We've got a handicap. Okay, that's essentially, I'm restating what I've just said in that slide. It stands to reason if, a, I'll give you, why would a son of God de come down here and do all these magic tricks? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't do anything. You know, he, he's demonstrating, he, he's, he's showing you how it can be done. He's showing you all the worlds of the universe, what can be done. Okay, now we're getting into some more interesting territory. We talked about social service. Jesus taught the preeminence of the individual, spiritual sovereignty. That is the core of this divine truth that he always taught. The truth was you are a son and you are a daughter of God. Love each other. Work together. Now, in today's world, the preeminence of the individual does not sit very high in our social structure or social ladder. Okay, the will of man decisions determines his experience. Okay, we've talked about the way you decide, the way you choose determines your experience. Okay, so he taught the importance of will and the right, right way to choose. Then he taught fellowship, friendship with God. I've mentioned friendship. He taught that. He taught loving service and the transcendency of the spiritual over the material. In other words, the spiritual realm dominates, if you like, for want of a better word, the material world. Okay. So you've heard the word gospel and you think, oh, gee, you know, what's going on here, you know? The world has never really attempted to live correctly. It's always been hijacked. Brothers and sisters, you know, we are all children of God. I've tried, no, not I've tried. I've suggested to you that personality has divine origin. These are the values within that concept. Trust, forgiveness, respectful of free will, people's liberty, privacy, people's privacy, compassion, generosity, tolerance, kindness, patience, honesty, service and love. These are the primary qualities of this realm, of this consciousness. By embracing those values and trying to live by them, you enhance your personal growth and you foster a noble personality. Now, a noble personality is the foundation stone of a long, enduring civilization. That is a fact. I've used the word realm. 
this is, I'm trying to suggest to you there is a realm that you can work in, that you can strive and explore, explore for yourself. Whatever I say, don't, don't, take, don't take my word for it. Just go exploring for yourself. Try it. Okay. Now, the following values retard personality. When embraced, the outcome is personality disintegration and civilization crumbles. These are abuse of trust, manipulation, deception, controlling, corruption, stealing, greed, blackmail. I'm sure a lot of you would realise or see examples of that in our society. It's not healthy. Our society is in grave danger. A lot of people are getting stressed. Okay, let's change the pace a little bit. A great teacher strives to be a good student and a great student strives to be a good teacher. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try and be good teachers and good students in our lives. I think that's what we should strive to do. Now I'm going to uh, give you an idea that the spiritual universe, for want of a better description, doesn't, isn't perfect. It's evolving. It's growing. We're all growing. We're all part of it. And it works like this. When you learn something and someone's following you, you give them a hand and you lift them up. You share, with, you share your knowledge. You become the teacher. Come, you lift them up. Then where you find yourself, you go, oh, then you accept a hand, you become the student, and you get lifted up. The entire universe, for want of a better word, is lifting itself up through evolution, through growth, through development. So I just gave you that as an idea of a concept that you may be able to work with. Okay. And we're back to the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem. When I was discussing about the tomb, I failed to mention that only about six were ever made, maybe ten at most. And why it remained hidden, we have no idea. It was like it was hidden behind some sort of strange energy that no one could see. Because Professor Mir Bendov was absolutely shocked when he found it. So, we discovered, we discovered that the land that the, that the tomb was located on was Islamic holy land for a long time. And Islamic holy land is called Waqf land. And on Waqf land, the trustees can only build a mosque, a school or a garden. So initially, when Martin and I discovered this information, we were prepared to visit the trustees of the Waqf in Jordan and ask them if they would like to participate in the building of the garden. Because at this stage, we were in the middle of negotiations with the Jerusalem municipality to take over control of the land. And this is about 2005. And then when we were doing further uh, investigations about the site, we, it was, we were told that in, after the 1967 war, the uh, council expropriated the land from the Waqf and then publicly gazetted the, the land as a garden for the people of Jerusalem and Israel. So that was in 1967. Then in 2005, we put a proposal to the council that the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem Trust, of which I'm a trustee, would build the garden on behalf of the people of Israel, free of charge, to preserve the tomb. That was our intention. 
So after a decade of negotiations, uh, the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem project started. Now, um, I think I've given a reasonable summation of uh, the life of Joshua and what he tried to do. Um, where he was laid to rest. And yes, he did reappear after the crucifixion, three days after, he did reappear. He did appear to the women. Of the women evangelists, none betrayed him, none denied him. Whereas the apostles, the male apostles, really struggled. Nevertheless, this is what happened. Um, Peter, one of the apostles, was so overcome, in fact all the apostles were so overcome by the resurrection that they kicked off a religion that was basically a relationship with the risen Christ and they'd forgotten all their teachings about having a personal relationship with God, about asking, about choosing and about developing their own personality. They simply had their socks blown off because this guy was resurrected. And it totally, it's a human error. You can understand it. If, if someone reappeared, you would obviously be overcome and overawed and you would tend to forget. It just completely overshadowed all the teachings that Joshua gave to the apostles for quite a few years. So that kicked off Christianity in a different direction. Nevertheless, Christianity became a powerful force and is the foundation stone of Western civilization. So, um, so what I'm, uh, what the Garden Project is about, is about the individual having a personal relationship with God and a personal relationship with one another. That's why it's called the Friendship Garden of Jerusalem. We're trying to uncover the original values of what was taught 2,000 years ago. And hopefully this project will be a symbol of interfaith harmony because it was once Islamic Holy Land. It was then declared land for the people, a garden for the people of Israel. And then through the generosity of the municipality, it was handed over to the trustees um, about 10 years ago. So now we're moving forward on the project and I'm going to explain a little bit more of the project after lunch. So thank you very much. <laughs>